Thanks, Ebony, and thank you all for, uh, for, for listening um, to this presentation. Um, so just to, to give you a brief background, um, this workshop grew out of a part of our IGNITE project, um, which Ebony mentioned earlier um, on monogenic diabetes. And um, in one of the things that the RFA asked for was, was an economic or payer perspective. And um, I was fortunate to have on campus um, health economist Daniel Mullins, who's here. And when we sort of talked about you know, what, what should, you know, what, how we should look at this, um, he said that it's not just about looking at cost effectiveness, which is sort of how sometimes people think about um, economic issues um, in healthcare, but that we really needed to engage with um, the payers because they're all different. They have all different perspectives. They're all different models. So we really need to have conversations with them in order to then be able to, to take action to see what needs to be done to, to make it possible to get um, to get genomic medicine reimbursed in a sustainable way. So we had a we have a panel, a small panel of payers who we've been working with to get input to guide our study. Um, and out of this um, grew, we were awarded a, a supplement to have a larger payer meeting across. It was a it was original. It was going to be an across Ignite um, meeting, and then it was really an across NHGRI meeting because there's so much interest in this topic. Um, and uh, so the title of the workshop ended up being in Unifying the Evaluation and Implementation of Genomic Medicine, um, but I have also known as the Payer Engagement Workshop. That's what's listed um, on today's agenda, um, and that's um, because the, the purpose of this was to engage payers, but we also, as we were coming up with the, the, the title and the agenda for the workshop, we really wanted to, to make it clear that we're having a conversation and that, that, it, that everybody has an agenda in this and we need to kind of sort out what our agendas are and we need to talk about it and communicate with each other. Um, and so it wasn't, it is about engaging payers and that's a really important component and that's ultimately a huge key, but it's, it's really all of us um, working together, figuring out a way to work together in a sustainable way. So, um, so, that, so after several months of, of calls um, and, and, other, and, and, and uh, um, group calls and individual calls with various people interested in this. Um, this culminated in this meeting that was just less than two weeks ago, th uh, two weeks ago Thursday on August 18th. Um, we had about 100 people were involved in the meeting, um, either, um, either at a very large um, conference table or um, calling in remotely. And um, so we, the, the group consisted of um, NHGRI program staff um, and attendees um, and um, patients. Uh, a couple of patients um, who were impacted by genomic medicine, both care providers and technology providers, um, um, researchers, and of course the payers. And our panel of payers, we had six different payers, although through, through a few of them are from the blues, they're from different parts of the blues, so with, which have very different perspectives. So you can see we had, we can see the, the list um, here that we had, um, including um, Deborah Smith, who was also on our planning committee from the um, federal employee program, Blue Cross Blue Shield. So, um, and so just so the, the format of the meeting was we, what, it was organized into case studies and also into roundtable discussions. So there was first, um, we had a brief um, introduction from Eric Green for on, the, on Ignite and, and genomic medicine, as, as he mentioned. He just uh, did, did something similar a couple weeks ago. Um, and then um, Daniel and I talked about the objectives, which were developed um, with Ebony and with the committee. Um, and, you know, because, you know, it's, it's really, again, it's a matter of talk and then action. And so, um, so these were the objectives we came up with. We want to build a process. We know there have been meetings like this before, and we wanted to figure out how can we start to build a process that's going to be on going that, 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 that engages all the stakeholders in, in um, evaluating and implementing genomic medicine um, to understand what evidence is needed and how it should be disseminated um, both you know, to the payers and then ultimately to the patients. Um, and, um, and then to identify what protocols both in research and in the clinic um, should be used to generate the, the evidence. And um, so we had, first we had a keynote speech from, um, from two people from Vermont, from the CEO of the, um, of the medical center and um, health network, which is, which is gearing up to be um, a single payer, um, provide single payer health for the entire state of Vermont. Um, and the main points 
um, that Dr. Rumstead made was that the invest that in, an investment in genomics is is a powerful tool um, to improve patient care and control the cost that can be linked to quality parameters. Obviously, in a if, if done in a in a strategic manner, and that they're actually looking very seriously at in the not too distant future a statewide whole genome sequencing plan um, in order to assist in developing lifelong care plans for their patients. And along with that was with him was um, Dr. Plavin, medical director of Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont, and they're currently piloting kind of as a, as a, as a kind of experiment, as a real-time experiment to look at the effectiveness of using um, genomics on that widespread level of universal for, um, for, um, for cancer patients, um, universal um, solid tumor um, sequencing using a, using a particular panel, and reimbursement has been approved for that. Um, so yeah, so so the so then so we had three case studies, and the case studies that we presented in order to kind of stimulate the conversation went from kind of simpler types of genetic tests to more complex type of genetic tests. So we started with um, with single variant. Uh, targeted variant testing, and we used as an example a pharmacogenetics example that's, that's been studied by, looked at by a lot of people and implemented by a lot of people, which is the use of, um, of uh, uh, CYP2C19 variant genotyping for people who are um, undergoing stenting. And, um, and uh, so Laurie Cavallari, who's here today, um, presented data both from, um, from their group at the University of Florida and also talked about work that's being done across the entire network with both network sites plus affiliates across nine sites to pool together data um, to look at um, the, to, to look very pragmatically at uh, the utility of um, CY2C19 genotyping for predicting um, response to clopridogrel. Um, and, and as you can see, you know, that this is, this is the, um, oh, wait, I guess, oh, here's the mouse. Okay. This is, uh, oh, you can't see the mouse. Um, but as you can see in red, that's the, the data from um, people who, um, who the, 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 the MI event free, free survival rate, and you can see that the people who are in red who um, had loss of function variants but were put on clopridogrel, but because they have a loss of function, they cannot convert prodrug um, to drug um, and had a much, much lower event free um, rate. And um, that data, again, as I said, it's been replicated. It's now being pulled together um, to produce um, some, what we think is going to be important evidence and for, for, for helping um, to guide what is happening. So that was presented. Um, and, um, and then there was a discussion. Most of the, 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 the actual presentations were very short in this meeting, and most of the emphasis was on discussion. So as Ebony said, this is very preliminary. We're currently working with a professional writer to, um, to develop the proceedings for this um, conference and, and review them. Um, but this is kind of some, some initial, some, um, initial um, output from, from notes that, that were um, taken at the meeting. Um, so, so a lot. So some of the discussion focused on the idea of preemptive versus reactive pharmacogenetics testing. So most of that testing, although it was, it took place before the stent was before the medication was prescribed. It's actually considered reactive because it was done in response to a certain event. So sort of thinking about well, what if we did this um, at the beginning um, before you know before there was an event and it was in the EHR. Um, so that generated conversations about the challenges in keeping the genomic information in the EHR, particularly in patients. Um, change um, insurance providers, um, what kind of clinical utility data is needed. Um, you might not be able to get this, this, um, this amount of data from all examples from every drug gene pair. Um, you know, looking at, you know, is genotype testing, how is it better, how is it worse than actual phenotype testing, um, which, is, which has a, a, a time aspect to it. Um, what constitutes, and we got into kind of broader questions of what constitutes medical necessity, um, how to define who and when a patient um, gets tested, um, and um, you know, and then lots of conversations about clinical utility and clinical validity, and then you know, really important is the communication of results because if you generate a result and it's just in the chart, it's not being used, then you might as well have not generated it at all. It's like the proverbial tree in the forest. So, um, so, so really importance of, of communication results and and can that and can that be reimbursed, um, and then discussions about variants that are not related to the particular prescribed medication, but also can inform other medications in other areas of medicine, um, thinking about how to develop and discuss gene-related treatment plans. And then, you know, again, this is just sort of recurring of tra how, to, how do you transfer information between systems and, and payers. Um, so for the second case, we moved up a little bit in complexity to talk about targeted sequencing panels. 
Um, and this um, example, this is this is the project that um, that I've been our, my group is doing for Ignite. And um, and I know you know one of the concerns that's been expressed about panels is kind of making sure that the panels that the actual genes on the panel are actionable. Um, concerns about even if the panel is you know even if it doesn't cost more to add more genes, um, then there may be less enthusiasm about covering genes where the action is not as clear. Um, so so as the example for panels, I talked about the project that we're doing at the University of Maryland, um, which is um, which in which we are looking among people among all people with diabetes to identify people who might have highly penetrant genetic forms or monogenic forms of diabetes, most notably um, Modi is, is the one that most people are familiar with. And so we, we've developed a process that, we've, that we're implementing and we're also disseminating in a private practice and another integrated health system um, to identify these patients with some very simple questions but are not always, that are not necessarily always in the patient chart, um, followed by some basic medical tests and um, uh, some medical tests that can be used to distinguish again with this idea that it, it, that currently anyway the the genetic testing is very expensive, um, but if you if you can screen out just like you do in, in any screen in newborn screening if you identify people um, who can most benefit from it then then it can be um, cost effective and valuable um, and um, and then we are so when we identify these individuals we're then sequencing several genes on a, on a panel. Um, and, um, and then if we find something, we are confirming and disclosing it um, and, and also doing research to follow up variants of unknown significance. And um, we, this is just, um, we, we've diagnosed um, several patients with monogenic diabetes. This is just one that benefits in kind of a way that you don't really think, you don't typically think about when you think about genomic medicine. We gave her a diagnosis that told her that actually she wasn't sick when she thought she might be getting sick. Um, she was told since her 20s that she was pre-diabetic. She was told in her late 20s that she needed, she, her blood sugar was high. She needed to really up her activity level. She needed to, to improve her diet and she just didn't know how she could do this because she was a kickboxer on a very intensive training program um, and, um, and on a very strict diet. Um, and um, so she ended up coming into our study, and we found that she had um, glucokinase deficiency um, in which rather than thinking sh people have prediabetes or mild diabetes and keep needing to be followed up to see if they'll get complications, they find out that they have a lifelong, um, a lifelong um, deficiency of, of the enzyme glucokinase that causes a lifelong my modest, modestly elevated blood sugar that doesn't lead to complications and doesn't require constant surveillance. And so this is actually of a lot of interest to payers because it actually is a, is what a, is a rare possibly rare um, example of a cost-saving um, finding. And so in discussing, um, the, in discussing panel-based testing, um, then these are some of the concerns that came up during the discussion. Um, that you know, one of the things we're doing is we're tracking. You know, we want to know how you know how much is this costing? Is it is it saving money? Is it worth it? Um, and that one of the things that came up is rather than looking maybe at costs, it might be better to just look at resource utilization, um, and then you can transfer that into costs for different institutions. Um, comes up, you know, that particularly when you get into these panels with these rare variants, um, it's hard to convert that to a randomized control trial. Um, and, you know, and then with these panels and the increasing t um, complexity, the information available to payers can be, you know, can be limited or, or unclear or, you know, or it has to be presented well because this is actually, this particular case that I presented is actually somewhat of a complex case, but it can be presented in a straightforward manner. So some of it has to do with the presentation. Um, but regardless, you know, just difficult to make an informed decision without a molecular technology background. Um, there's also just kind of assorted issues that are, you know, that are just more kind of communication and policy issues and just, you know, th things need different areas needing to keep up with other areas, which is the, which is coding issues. There's CPT codes that stand for similar things. And when you're talking to an insurer, you're not just talking to an insurer, you're talking to an individual and each individual may have different information. Um, and then just lots of talk about, you know, how, how can we use existing, how can we use outcomes and knowledge from these to inform future decisions? And, but, and then again, emphasizing that ec economic data is not the whole picture, it adds weight, but they don't, but they, they were very clear, even all of the payers, although they have different perspectives, it doesn't solely drive medical policy decision making. 
Um, so then we, our last case was, was looking at genome-wide methods. We talked about um, actually a couple of examples of genome-wide methods. Um, Mark Williams, I think, is going to talk a little bit more about the work being done with, about the success in getting coverage for exome sequencing for developmental delay um, at Geisinger. And then we also had Deborah Leonard, also from the University of Vermont, um, talk more about their genome-wide sequencing plan with the idea of kind of a different paradigm of, of thinking about medicine and genomic medicine with the idea that, um, you know, that, that thinking about um, how, e you know, basically that each individual, you know, has, an indiv has a, a lot of influences, including the genome, um, and that leads to a phenotype, and then how that, how that interact, how, you know, and, the, and then the importance of the interaction with the patient and the healthcare provider. Um, but, you know, really emphasizing the idea as of the genome as an ongoing um, resource. Um, and so then next we heard from, we heard from Greg Merhar, who had been experiencing um, chronic pain, um, chronic attacks of abdominal pain um, since his teens, um, so for over 30 years. And as part of a um, kind of, you know, as part of a kind of fun project, as part of the Understand Your Genome project, um, he ch chose to have his genome sequenced and having his genome sequenced um, actually came, yielded um, a variant. It was actually not even a, a clinically, it was not a, what, was, what would be classified as clinically actionable. It was a variant, a, a, not, not a pathogenic or a likely pathogenic variant, but it was actually a variant called a, it was a notable variant or noteworthy variant of unknown significance. There wasn't quite enough evidence to call it that, but it was suspected to be an important variant um, in familial Mediterranean fever. And he turned out to um, respond, when, once, the, once he found out that that's what it was and talked to a few doctors, um, was, we finally uh, was convinced to put him on colchicine and his symptoms um, um, ameliorated within 24 hours. Um, and so this is a really dramatic example, um, but, um, but nevertheless a, you know, a true example of, um, of, of how different the, the, the model of having the genome as a resource would be um, in the future versus kind of being guided by symptoms and phenotypes. It was, noted, it was noted that he has blonde hair and blue eyes, and nobody ever suspected him of having familial Mediterranean fever. Um, and so um, the discussion points around genome-wide methods, um, you know, focused on questions of, you know, is, is, you know, should genome and exome sequencing be a first resort? Should, should it be done on everybody? Should it be a last resort? Um, they, um, that, that there needs to be a, a time element linked to clinical utility. Um, there are questions about, asked about how many sequences do you actually have to get to, to get a significant clinical result. That's obviously very dramatic. This is a little bit different, but um, at um, for Geisinger, it was, it was noted that about 3% of healthy patients have a clinically actionable variant in one of the, the, the genes that they consider actionable. Um, um, the, uh, it's, but it's also noted that the cost of genome sequencing chemistry doesn't capture the cost associated with the interpretation and the therapy changes, um, which can sometimes result in higher costs, not necessarily lower costs. Um, uh, the mechanism for, uh, there needs to be a mechanism for maintenance um, in the EHR um, and also payment for um, reinterpretation of genomic sequence at both at the, not just the variant level, not just finding, reclassifying a variant, but are there other genes? And then when other phenotypes come up, can, can you then um, get an interpretation out of the data that's already been done? Is that, is, that, uh, is that data accessible? And is there a mechanism to pay for that interpretation? Um, so a lot is talked about this future ideal that genome sequencing could be done once to inform um, future care, but it was also stated that the current reality is that the technology is evolving. The coverage is not perfect, and so we're not necessarily quite at the point where we can, we can do it once and be done. So that's sort of just the, the conflicting realities that we're dealing with right now. Um, so we then uh, reported back from the, um, the lunch roundtables. So during lunchtime, we had a working lunch where there are about um, six different roundtables addressing questions related to the objectives of the meeting. And so one of the, um, one of the uh, roundtables focused on kind of on 
the idea of building some kind of coalition to address all these issues on an ongoing basis. And we talked about we actually need to really clarify exactly what we're trying to accomplish. Um, and also, we need to really know what the existing organizations are, which you know, we know some of them, you know, the, the, the various roundtables. Um, and you know, what, can, we, can we build on them? Can we work with them? We need to, to clearly identify the stakeholders we've started to do. Um, and uh, there was also some question about whether payers could um, drive the coalition, and it was made, it was pretty agreed upon that they probably couldn't. They're very, a lot of them are be, interested in being active participants, but they're not really able to have the resources, and so that those resources, you know, would have to have to come um, from elsewhere. Um, in terms of evidence needed, um, some of the things that were discussed were the need for evidence on downstream costs. Um, looking at guideline setting organizations and you know separating out kind of the organization's guidelines and you know how does how does how does the organization's agenda enter into it um, the really importance of getting things out into peer-reviewed publications particularly in the higher impact journals um, or is most likely more likely um, to make it into practice um, that the large the large payers gather and and analyze their own evidence to make decisions um, there was some idea, some thought, and this could go probably for the coalition too. You know, could the in vitro diagnosis um, manufacturers support studies to, um, to to generate evidence? And you know, and then just really needing to more define what we mean by change in care. Um, the you, know, you can see there's a lot of overlap in these topics, but the the third set of roundtables focused on designing research and clinical protocols. Again, that randomized clinical trials are often not possible. Um, the need to kind of focus on high clinical value dis conditions or diseases um, rather than really focusing on gaining reimbursement in terms of what to, what to, to study. Um, it's, it's challenging to get the payers and the manufacturers to share the risk. Um, the idea of using economic modeling studies um, before starting a study, so, um, so, so modeling the different costs and, and trying to figure out a model and then doing the actual study that you, that you need both. The modeling studies don't do everything, but, but you need that first. Um, and, and along with that, you know, we're really working closely with the payers up front at the beginning and designing the study, which is, is, which is what we're trying to do. Um, again, economic analysis, not the most critical factor in study design, but should be considered. Um, and then there was some disagreement about this because even you know because because for some people the diagnosis is an end it's an end to a diagnostic odyssey but you know is a diagnosis is a diagnosis enough or you know how much is, is it important how it affects patient care um, and and then finally the ta the groups on disseminating the evidence talked about interest in having a central database some kind of central database for evidence. Um, talked about the idea of having some kind of clearinghouse for letters of ne medical necessity, um, and you know again um, emphasized that this is how payers generally make decisions. There's also input um, taken for some from patients and adv advocacy groups. The idea of some kind of newsletter was proposed, um, and uh, and seemed to have some appeal if we could figure out how to centralize that. Um, and uh, so, you know, again, we're still we're still going through um, many hours of of, um, of audio footage and putting all this together. But the kind of preliminary summi summary of the key recommendations are that there just there needs to be some kind of we're looking for a standardized process for getting the clinical utility um, information out, um, and that communication of genetic results across across different levels, not just to the patients, um, but you know, to, to the payers, to the providers, and the communication is, has kind of both bioinformatic and, and people aspects to it, so we need to, to take better advantage of bioinformatics tools for, for getting things incorporated into clinical decision support, but then we also need to figure out to what extent um, we need specialists to communicate very specific results. Um, and then, you know, and then this idea that, um, that, of, you know, that, that we see in the future that a whole genome sequence at some point um, it does look like it would be an ongoing resource. And so thinking about coverage um, and also, um, organ also um, storing of data, um, you know, you, you needs to be looking at that, at how can we make sure that the data is available and how can we make sure that there's funding available to interpret and run and actually run and basically run an in silico test, um, you know, where, where the test is separated from the actual um, laboratory procedure. Um, and so that's our preliminary report, um, and I just want to, uh, to thank um, everybody. This was a really big effort. We had a very dedicated um, planning committee. Um, as you can see, we had a large turnout to the meeting. 
um, and um, and we were pleased to get a lot of um, a lot of uh, a lot of very frank discussion about um, some of the the challenges faced, um, and so we're looking forward to the next steps, um, which, as I said, we, we will be publishing the proceedings in the next few months at, at the Ignite site. Um, we also will be um, um, uh, interpreting, um, developing an author group and submitting a manuscript based on, our, based on the important um, findings from this meeting to a peer-reviewed journal. And then we'll be direct developing a, a strategic plan um, for you know, how to continue this engagement and, um, and obtain resources. So again, um, just want to thank everybody um, who was involved, and thank you all. And I'm happy to take questions. Oh, did you? But we do have time for a couple of quick questions, Mark. Uh, yeah, thank you, Tony. Um, I think one of the things that I heard uh, out of the group um, that I hadn't heard previously was at least a couple of the payers. Um, had indicated uh, interest and uh, opportunity to actually participate as part of study teams um, to address this issue, which is, um, I think, a, a much more productive way to uh, approach uh, developing the evidence, because it's very difficult to, to put payers in front of you and say, well, tell us what evidence you need, because they don't really necessarily know what evidence they need. Um, but having them involved as part of the study team can help them to say, well, this is a question that if I were evaluating this as a medical director would be really, in, you know, I'd need to know the answer to that. I know Howard's had some experience with that that's been relatively uh, positive. And I think the more we can uh, try and encourage that within um, whatever uh, projects we have um, uh, that are funded by defining that as part of the, um, uh, the desired investigator team, it would be um, good. And then we have um, Levi. I, I was wondering whether there was any discussion of the role of the Moldy X and Palmetto yeah, discussions in your sessions. Um, oh, of, of whether of Pal Palmetto, we, we, we unfortunately were unable to have a representative from Palmetto at the meeting. Um, but what, what was your, I guess, what was, I, could you clarify your question? Yeah, I, I'm just curious about what, whether you'd had any input from a, one of the national groups that really, I think, has huge impact mm -hmm. on, on utilization of genomics and paying for it, and that is the Moldy X uh, operation, which is based in Palmetto as see, part yeah. of Medicare. Yeah, yeah, no, we, yeah, on this round, we were, you know, unable to, to engage them at this point. Yeah. We have Levi, Muin, and then. So it's a, it was a great summary. My question is somewhat related to that one because, you know, when you have, uh, we, there, about a month ago, there was a similar uh, meeting in, in the Kanger side, a think tank that had multiple stakeholders at, at the table, including several private payers. And, and it, was, it was a very interesting discussion, but it also makes one mindful of the kind of competing agendas that can be uh, at play on both sides. So obviously on, on the side of the people who are doing genome sequencing, of course, there's an agenda to uh, get payers to cover the cost of doing that because uh, it's not always easy to have that come by other means. On the payer side, though, there's uh, often an agenda to avoid having to pay for it. Um, it well, not, not so much the testing, per se, but the cascade that comes after, that may come after, that may encumber uh, their books. So, um, and, and, and in fact, on the can when we had the cancer discussion, it was very interesting because there were kind of questions, well, what kind of evidence? And, and you know, some of the payers would uh, kind of lob out these studies that theoretically were interesting, but functionally would be impossible to do and would take a decade. And, you know, so, so what sort of came out of um, some of those discussions afterwards was, well, maybe the middle ground is actually to work with uh, Medicare, which theoretically is uh, uh, sort of has less skin in the game in terms of you know uh, the the financial encumbrance. Their, their goal is to is to figure out what coverage makes sense, and so maybe the way to move forward is you have the the experts of particular disease areas where genomic medicine is has the potential to be relevant, uh, who can help really carve out feasible uh, intermediate studies that uh, get 
to the issue of clinical utility uh, and could be done sort of uh, with consortia like this, et cetera, and working with, um, with Medicare uh, to, uh, within populations where there, there could be um, sort of, uh, there, there could be studies that where it, it, whatever the results are, ideally those will be less biased by, you know, one side or the other, but on the other hand, they may, it may be that the private payers will follow. So if Medicare dec decides, okay, this is something that we see and we think it's worth it, then the private payers may likely follow as opposed to sort of putting on them uh, the onus uh, to sort of come up with their plans because, it, and, and one, one reasonable point that they might make is, well, you know, we have all, we have stakeholders, we can't put stakeholders uh, money, uh, shareholders' money into research, you know, so, and the, which is not an unreasonable perspective because those are our retirement accounts and stuff like that. So, um, so it may well be that uh, that Palmetto or Medicare in general, co in collaboration with consortia like this, is the is the right intermediate step. And obviously, the payers we keep them involved, but we don't put it too much on them to try to figure out how to get uh, coverage. Right. I mean, yeah. I mean, you know, that's that, that's a really good point. Very important to to um, engage uh, Medicare in this process. Um, I just want, want to just comment on something that you said earlier, and I, I think what, one of the things we're trying to do with these meetings is, you know, you sort of talked about, well, there's there's people who, want, you know, like the payers don't want to pay for it, and the, you know, and the, the, um, the you know, the, the people doing sequencing want to do it, and I think part of the idea is, yeah, is that that of of actually have actually having these these meetings um, is that you can kind of get a little bit more um, a little bit more uh, uh, dimensional than that, you know, because I think that is kind of maybe one of the barriers is that we're kind of thinking is that kind of the thought is like something doesn't get covered, oh, payers don't want to pay for it, but, you know, just learning more about, because, because yes, the, you know, Medicare, um, you know, because, you know, they may, they may they're, they're going to work differently than the payers, but the payers in the end still, it's their objective is not, I don't think can be simplified to, you know, we don't want to, to pay for it. It's a matter of that their, their perspective is just different. And so if they can understand, and, and I, you know, what the purpose is, and I think also the the importance of having because there's there's no, there's no there's no like representative example of genomic medicine, and I think that's part of it. And so, um, so so the importance of kind of of the ongoing conversations and hearing the specific examples, and as you said, you know, having people experts in the specific diseases present, and it really has to be an ongoing process. So, okay, just a couple more quick questions. It looks like Moon, and then Roger in the back. Thank you, Tony. <clears throat> this is a conversation that has been occurring for the last two decades, more, more or less, as uh, genomics has matured from research to practice. Uh, the question I have specifically, um, did the conversation include things like coverage with evidence development? Because there are situations where clinical validity is established. You need just a little bit of a push for clinical utility that the right trial may or may not have been done this kind of partnership that Mark was talking about with designing studies for clinical utility or even covering for them until you get the final results. I know this came up with CMS for a while, but I'm wondering if that was part of the conversation. Oh, certainly, yes, yeah, certainly in terms of de de the importance of designing studies for clinical utility. But I think one of the points about that is captured in this idea. I mean, it's kind of grossly, you know, the randomized clinical trial doesn't work for everything. But the, I mean, the thing with genomics is, you know, for example, I talked about an example in our study where we found, identified a child who had an insulin mutation that caused her diabetes. And that was hugely helpful to the family, but that's very rare. And so to achieve the clinical utility at the, you know, at the highest level is not possible because you have all, you have all these uncommon variants with all these uncommon variant conditions. And so again, the importance of of really having the different people involved, the patients and the providers, to communicate, you know, why is that clinically useful, um, even though it, it, you know, the, the particular study design doesn't necessarily lend itself to that. So I don't know if that answers your question, Muin, but, um, but, yeah. Last question. Yeah, in, in reference to the panel testing, uh, what? One question that always comes up is panel composition, and I think there's, there's not a lot of consensus and actually quite a bit of controversy. I'm wondering about the process that you went through to select the genes on your panel. Yeah, that's a great question, and, and that was a question the payers were interested in as well. Um, we, we, started, we started with the, the genes that are considered the maturity onset diabetes of the young genes, um, the MODI genes. 
Um, and but where you know where in, in truth most of them are rare, so it's really only three of them that have you know very clearly um, international guidelines for clinical utility. Um, but then we also looked at syndromes that could also be useful to diagnose because they would tell you about other symptoms. Um, so we looked. So we really focused primarily on um, on conditions that could be missed um, and thought to be um, ordinary diabetes. But we also, there definitely was kind of a, a, an area where it got gray, where, you know, where, you know there's, a, there's two genes on the panel um, that are involved in familial hyperinsulinemia and have not been reported as diabetes genes, but theoretically variants in the reverse direction could be associated with diabetes and just have never been caught, never been looked for. Um, so and I think, and that was a, the concern of addressed at our initial payer consult meeting for just our study, um, was that, was kind of, well, you know, what am I, you know, and because we had some for, for monogenic IB, obesity, uh, monogenic obesity, and kind of, you know, what are you going to do with that? And that was the exact conversation we had. We said, well, you know, the, the clinical utility might be there, but you need more cases in order to know what it is. And they said, again, you know, we don't want to pay for research, but yet there needs to be some way that we can gather that, that evidence, not just from people who are consenting to a research study um, in order to, to figure out what to do with it. So, Thank you, Tony. And you'll be hearing more about it. We'll have meeting proceedings um, as well as hopefully a paper coming out. Um, just some um, housekeeping things. Um, First, the meeting format for the rest of the day, we're going to have four different sessions. The sessions will start out with two talks on the state of science and the gaps, and then the night investigator will um, highlight some um, things that we've done um, within that um, area, as well as opportunities that Ignite may be particularly um, good to actually um, tackle. Um, just to let you know, the talks will be 15 minutes each, and please hold your questions for the discussion part. There will be 30 minutes at the end of each session for a discussion, and it's going to be moderated, and we'll have discussants actually leading that discussion. So if you could please hold your um, questions and comments until the end of um, each session. Um, I want to thank the planning committee that um, took a lot of time. We met every week. Um, Actually, coming up with the agenda, they gave us a lot of feedback on not only the background document, but how to make this meeting useful. Um, Katrina Goddard, Lon Carden, Chris Chute, um, Howard McLeod, and Casey Overby were wonderful and um, really made this meeting um, what it is. Um, also, the, um, to let you know, the microphones, please use your microphones. Um, they're at the table. If you don't have a microphone near you, there is a microphone at the back that you can walk up to. Um, we have a background document in your packet that was put together by our Administrative Coordinating Center at Duke University, led by Jeff Ginsburg and Lori Orlando. Um, this was also emailed to you. If you didn't have a chance to read it, please, this is a great document. It really tells you um, what Ignite has done um, thus far. And um, I'm going to give it over. We're going to have pictures at 11, 15 at at the 11 o'clock break. So if everybody could gather for pictures um, before you leave the room, that would be wonderful. And I am going to give it to Colette Hoppy, um, Fletcher Hoppy, who I introduced when she was out of the room, but she is actually the heartbeat of the network. And so um, Colette has some um, comments as well. Hi, so this is just a quick notice that during the 3.55 p.m. review of recommendations and the 4.20 prioritizing future opportunities, we hope to engage audience participation through a poll. So during lunch, I'm going to circulate a trial version of the poll. You're welcome to participate via webinar, via the internet, uh, or via text message. So I'll be circulating a link to all of the meeting attendees. Please look for an email from Colette Fletcher Hoppy, that's me, at the National Human Genome Research Institute. Um, and for those of you participating via text, I'll include some further instructions. Essentially, to join the poll via your phone, you need to text a code to a specific number, and then uh, we can move through the different poll questions one at a time. Unfortunately, if you're participating via text, you can't really skip around the different poll questions. And uh, please remember to text the word LEAVE in all capital letters when you're done with the poll. Thank you, Colette. Um, we will go ahead and start with our first session, Genomic Medicine Implementation in Diverse Healthcare Settings and Populations. If the um, speakers, moderators, as well as discussants will come to the front of the room. 
Um, and if at the end of each session, I know we have a break after this one, but for the rest of the day, at the end of the session, if the next session speakers, moderators, and discussants could kind of come forward at the end, that would be great. So um, it will save some time. And as well as the note takers. Sorry. Thank you. <laughs> 